Guys, uh, thanks for coming. And as uh, Daniel said, I'll be talking about emergentuniverse.org, which is a new initiative in science communication. So, in a nutshell, what is this initiative? Emergentuniverse.org is a virtual, an online virtual science museum that uses the concept of emergence to introduce and communicate complex science. Now, if you're fully going to appreciate this initiative, what I'll need to do for you is define exactly what we mean by a virtual science museum. What is the concept of emergence? And then how do we use these together to communicate science? But before I do that, I want to give you just a little indication of the success that we've been having with this methodology. So if you want to measure success for an online, um, so I'm trying to see if there's a clicker that will click my computer. If you want to measure a success for an online entity, one of the first things you can ask is, are people coming to look at what you've put out there? The second thing you can ask is, if they're coming, what do they do when they get there? So first off, um, not first off, but one way to get a quick snapshot view of what's happening is free, is Google Analytics. So let me show you what kind of results we have for Google Analytics for our site, emergentuniverse.org. And we went live in October. And uh, since October, our total number of visits, this was from last week, we're, we're, we were within 20 of 10,000 the last time I looked. So basically, we had 10,000 visits to our website. Now, you will see that we got a, a large percentage of those 6,000 in October. But since October, we studied out for all months subsequent, we've had about 1,100 visitors per month. What was different about the first month? The first month, we had a couple very key advertising events. So for example, um, early in October, we got a blog post about emergentuniverse.org on the Cosmic Variance blog, which is one of Discover Magazine's very popular blogs. And from that post, we got about 2,500 visits in three days. So you can see that the appropriate advertising can really um, bump up a particular month. But on these other months, without any advertising, we've held very steady. So sort of the bottom line in number of visitors is we're getting about 1,100 per month. We expect on the order of 15,000 visits per year. So what are these visitors doing when they're coming? And another, another question is, OK, of total visits, that's a lot of people coming to visit your site in a year. But how does that compare to other sites out there? And Google gives you some benchmarks. And it divides sites into three groups, small, medium, and large. And you can see these are average visitor numbers per month for these types of sites. And you can see that uh, even though we're fairly new initial inception, we've settled out kind of right at the border. We're significantly larger than the small sites. We're not as large as the big sites, except or the medium-sized sites, except when we had some advertising. If you look at libraries of the large libraries museums, 32,000. I have no way to check this, but my assumption that this is places like Library of Congress, uh, perhaps the Exploratorium, very large, very long-standing institutions uh, fall in this category. But what I really want to focus on is, given that we have a substantial number of visitors, what do these visitors do when they come to the site? And Google Analytics gives you a few measures. So the first one is bounce rate. What does bounce rate mean? Um, bounce rate says, for a given visit, if the visitor comes into your site on a given page, the visitor leaves without going to any other pages. That's counted as a bounce. So this is the percentage of visitors that do not explore your site. Therefore, a low number is a really good thing. So if you look at the benchmark's averages, you see it's pretty much around 50% as a standard bounce rate. That's people who don't explore your site. Our bounce rate. Uh, over sort of our consistent numbers is 25%. So we're doing twice as well as your average library and museum site in terms of getting people to look in and looking at other pages beyond the one they came in on. Okay, but they could just be clicking around. Are they stopping and spending any time? So then you look at what's the average time visitors are spending on the site. And if you look at averages, if we discount small sites, because we really aren't falling in that category, 
Then we see that you have, for libraries and museums, which are most comparable, about two minutes. For all medium sites, about two and a half minutes. If you look at our numbers, our consistent numbers for November through February, six and a half minutes. People are spending, on average, three times longer on our site than they are spending on other uh, museum and library type sites. And one of the things you should keep in mind is when you first look at these numbers, you go, people are only spending two minutes? But remember, this is an average, and you've got a big distribution, and you've got a lot of people who are just exploring things, and they come in, and they immediately turn around and go, this wasn't where I wanted to be. So for every person that spent just a couple seconds on the site, if your average is going to be six and a half minutes, there must be another person who spent 13 minutes exploring the site. And I ask all of you to ask yourself, when was the last time you spent 13 minutes on a given website? And I will say that 4% of our visitors spend half an hour or more on the website. So uh, our website is being explored. And then finally, just uh, percent new. Most people think that a uh, higher percentage of new visitors is better. I think it's a bit iffy. I'm really happy our number of 75% is a bit more new than comparable sites. But what this tells me is uh, one in four visits is someone who liked the site well enough to come back. But three and four visits are new people who haven't been to the site before, which is going to keep our site propagation growing. So I'm actually really happy with that balance. So the bottom takeaway from this site is that, uh, for this site, from this slide, is that we're getting a reasonable number of visitors. We're um, encouraging them and engaging them so they explore the site. And they stick around for a significant fraction of time. And I think that this is an, an excellent result. So the question is then, what is this site that's bringing these people in and getting them to explore? So our site is a virtual science museum. And I want to say, what do I mean by a virtual science museum? What distinguishes one? First of all, I already implied this. It's an online entity that, in this case, does not have any physical counterpart. This online entity, in some way, creates a virtual environment. And it's an interactive space. So I want to talk about the last two just a moment more to give you an idea what I mean by that. And the first one, unfortunately, the internet is not working today. So I can only show you my sites. I can't show you the comparison sites I was going to show you. But they're pretty standard, so you can probably imagine them. So what I was going to do to show you what I mean by a virtual environment, we show you two websites that use text, images, and multimedia to convey something about science. And you can see one I was going to see, show you was nationalgeographic.com, which is a beautifully designed website. But if you go to that site, you look it up, it's like looking at a page in a magazine. It makes sense if that's what you are, if you're National Geographic. But it's, it's a flat, plain piece of paper. It doesn't draw you in. It doesn't have any quality of an immersive experience. And now, because the internet's not working, I have to, let's see, get to it this way. I was going to show you this page. So this is a page uh, of our uh, museum, one of the activities that we have. And you can see immediately that it's fully designed. We, work, we made a choice to work totally within two-dimensional programming. Yet we use graphics to create a sense of space. And you can see if you move around on this site that you have whoops, that you have entities that dynamically move in and out and they act like physical en entities. And that if you move to the next level, you find yourself in oh, stop that. <laughs> some sort of environment. Uh, let's see, I can't remember even. Yes, that is. That is Emily. Um, so that's, that's and, and the other thing that you can see from looking at this page, there we go, um, is that it was highly interactive. And so what do I mean by this interactivity? Well, one of the important things about interactivity is yes, on any website you have to click to find things you want, but then you get to be passive. You sit and watch a video. You sit and read something. 
Here, in order to move around to make anything happen, the interface is user-driven. So it's an active environment. This promotes exploration. And because an online outreach activity is free choice, so nobody's required to go here, we need to engage these people and encourage them to come. Um, that interactivity is, is really helpful in that engagement. Okay, why would you choose this particular outreach methodology? So first thing, let's, let's compare it to a physical museum, right? You're going to compare it to other outreach options. Museums are like a physical museum. An online museum is a, has the capability to be fun and engaging. You have activities to do and you learn that way. In addition, unlike a physical museum, there are no geographical boundaries. If you saw on my Google Analytics slide, you saw that we have visitors from 96 different countries to our site already. And there are no admission costs, which for certain visitors is prohibitive for going to the museum. In terms of funding such uh, exhibits, the costs are all approximately 20% of the cost of funding a full physical exhibit. And in addition to the exhibit costs, you don't have any cost for the physical space and upkeep of that physical space. So there's substantial advantages if you uh, choose the museum format to going online and virtual. What about print compared to print or other media that one might use for outreach? Well, internet, in a, in a recent National Science Board, the 2010 survey report that just recently came out, uh, they find already that internet is the second most popular source of science for people in the U.S. And that comes in second to television. But the advantage of working on the internet as compared to television or any of the other print media is that you have nearly free long-term distribution. Okay, It's not a one-time run. It's always there. You can get more and more people looking at it. And additionally, it's expandable over time. So it's not, again, it's not a one-time thing. You can make changes, you can add new exhibits, you can have a news section. Okay, but then you go, okay, well, all this is true about internet, and I really just made this comparison already. Compared to traditional website, you're going to engage through interactivity, and in that way, you're going to enable active learning, which, um, Currently, at least, we believe that's the best way to learn. You know, that kind of pendulum swings back and forth. Um, okay, but so if we agree that an online science museum is a really good outreach methodology, if we're going to design it, your design's always going to be better if you decide for whom you're going to design it before you start. So who is the target audience for emergentuniverse.org? And the audience that that we decided upon were college-bound or educated 16 to 30-year-olds across a broad, broad range of disciplines. Of course, an internet activity makes a lot of sense for this particular target audience, even more than for a general audience, because this is generation-wide, they're the net generation, they're connected, you can't even get them off these things, so internet is probably, if they surveyed just this age group, internet would probably be their primary source of information. Okay, but why choose this audience? So first of all, this is, in this country at least, this is a ne neglected group as far as science outreach is concerned. And this always baffles me because these people are the people who in the near future are going to become the writers, the talk show hosts, the journalists, the policy makers, the politicians, all the people are going to make decisions about funding, policy, uh, influence other people. So I think this is an important group of people to have in your camp. And the other thing that we have found with this website is that uh, we, can't, we don't go too much younger than this because as you'll see, emergence is an abstract concept. But anybody with internet savvy sort of across a very broad range of uh, age groups tends to really enjoy and and um, want to explore this website. So I think we've been, we've been very effective in that regard. Okay, so we want to create an online science museum. We created an online science museum to target this audience, but we had to decide how are we going to engage these visitors. And since we're interested in visitors 
who aren't already interested in going to a science website, how are we going to hook these people in? And this is where this concept of emergence comes in. Emergence has the capability to be a very interdisciplinary um, hook for drawing people in and getting them interested. But of course, it has a one downfall that you have to explain it first. So that's what I'm going to do for those who don't, aren't familiar with this uh, concept. And this particular uh, definition in graphics was taken directly from the home page of the website. So if you click on emergence, what you see is the following. If you consider some example systems like molecules in a liquid, neurons in a brain, people in a city, when the many parts of the system interact, they can generate behaviors in the whole system that aren't found in the parts themselves. We call these surprising behaviors emergence. So, for example, molecules in a liquid. If the liquid freezes, the properties on the macroscopic scale of that liquid have completely changed you've gone from something that pours to something that's solid, and yet the molecules are still the same. So the properties of the liquid or the solid are not intrinsic to the part themselves, so they're emergent properties. Similarly, a brain has consciousness. How does that arise from a bunch of neurons which clearly are not individually conscious? And uh, people in the city, a good example from that case, is um, Manchester, England expanded dramatically without a government during the Industrial Revolution, and it zoned itself, in spite of the fact there was no governing body. So again, somehow the interactions between the people created something new. So how are we going to use this, this idea of emergence? Well, we can take the idea of emergence and go a step far farther and think about it as a perspective, a way of looking at complex problems. And this is from uh, a comic that we designed and created for the Emergent Universe site. And I want you to just look at this panel here. And I'm just going to, this was actually a heavy text panel, but I'm just going to read. I had just, um, down here, there's an activity that clicks out of this panel that explains the idea of multiple length scales. Um, we give it the name Zoom because uh, our visitors are familiar with zooming in and out of Google Earth. So with that concept of different length scales, they, and, and they've also just been told about uh, parts in the whole of emergence, they recognize that we need to start thinking in terms of new world view. Specifically one that recognizes that it's the interactions between parts at different length scales that give rise to the behaviors of the whole. And in order to solve it, she comes down here and she says, right, to solve real problems, we're going to need to understand these connections between the parts and the whole. So once again, you, what it's really telling you is if you have a complex problem, then you have a series of levels of length scales. And you start at the smallest, and you have to go, okay, what do those parts create that we wouldn't have predicted? That's one level, and then that creates parts that create something at the next level. And you follow this chain all the way up to the level that you're interested in. And of course, part of the you know, in solving problems is deciding what levels are going to be important to you in, in working through this. So, emergence then is an umbrella comp, uh, concept that can be used to encompass an enormous range of disciplines from economics and sociology to superconductivity, uh, neurology, numerous disciplines. And Given that we have to explain emergence before we start, why is it a good concept to use to hook people in to science? So first of all, it's intriguing. I mean, consciousness is an intriguing phenomena right there. But let's look uh, here at this one. This is uh, Malaysian fireflies. Thousands of them flash synchronously. But it turns out that this idea of emergence is to most people um, counterintuitive to start because the initial thought that people have is if all of these things are doing this together, there must be somebody directing them. There must be a lead firefly. And it turns out, and we have an activity to show this, that there is no leader. And so this adds a, oh wow, gee whiz, this is really kind of a cool, intriguing concept to all of these problems because it goes, 
the, the counterintuitive is not that hard to understand, but it, it, it becomes surprising, and surprising is always intriguing. Additionally, this perspective is relevant because it can be applied to helping solve many of society's big challenge problems, and because it connects all these levels together, um, in terms of that perspective of how does this level lead to this one, lead to this one, the transdisciplinary approach, it's very good at highlighting how specifically fundamental, fundamental disciplines and research in those disciplines can contribute to problems of importance to society. And finally, because it's so multidisciplinary, the things that are encompassed by emergence, providing a broad range of examples in the home page allows us to, to likely overlap with interests that our target audience already holds. It's hard, I haven't figured out how to say this yet. But uh, the idea is pretty much anyone who comes to the site will have a set of interests, and one or more of those interests has a really good chance of overlapping with something that is emergent. So they can take this concept and apply it to things that they already care about, and we challenge them to do this. So this helps increase our, it, their interest level. So it's intriguing, it's relevant, and they connect it to things that they already care about. And the advantage of that is therefore that emergence, this using this concept, helps us to engage our target audience, whether or not science was their main focus. Yes, it's uh, five o'clock. You started oh, about five minutes late. Okay. Okay. So I showed you in terms of uh, how successful this was in engagement. I already showed you that our visitors have a low bounce rate. They explore the site. They stay for a long time uh, statistically. But we also did another test. Um, we did a small prototype study. We ended up having 43 users in our target age group. And one of the questions that we asked them was very simple. What did you like about the site? And this is uh, some representative concepts or comments that they told us. It's very engaging. You made it fun to learn. It's really cool. Uh, information relates to our life, encouraged discovery, it was fun to explore, you got me to look at the world in a different way. Um, and, even more important, when we asked them about telling their friends, 95% of this prototype group expressed interest in telling their friends about that su this site. So that's saying that we have definitely engaged their interest through this method. Okay, so I've told you about what I mean by virtual science museum, and also what the concept of emergence is. So how do we put these together to communicate complex science? Before you communicate anything, you should figure out what it is you're trying to say. So what were our objectives? Obviously, if we're going to use emergence, we needed to explain it. And we also wanted for the interest hook to show its relevance to a diversity of problems. Then we wish to uh, illustrate the emergent perspective and how that sort of you know, transdisciplinary uh, approach um, creates value for solving scientific and global challenges. So these two areas are really um, covered already in the parts of the site that have already launched. After that, our homepage is designed so that we can add, um, and I'll show you that in a minute, that we can add an unlimited number of additional uh, activity areas. Think of them as exhibit halls, as you will. And so for each one of these areas, these halls, places on the site that you can put a series of exhibits, um, what, what our goals were was to use emergence as a filter that will help us excite our visitors and teach them about whatever our chosen topic of research is show through this transdisciplinary emergent perspective how this research contributes to solving important problems that our visitors care about. And critically important, inspire a personal relationship between the visitors and these topics. Why is that critical? Well, research has shown that unless you create that emotional bond between someone and, and some topic or idea, they'll walk away from it and they won't come back. 
If you want someone to keep something, and this is our, our terminology, close to, close to their heart, if you want them to care about your research topic or emergence throughout their lives and make this a priority, you have to establish this kind of, of personal relationship. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we communicate these objectives by creating virtual exhibits? So the first thing is deciding on the content, and as I already told you, we create exhibit halls. We already have one on emergence, we have one on analytes, and I'm currently working on one on superconductivity, but we have the ability to add an unlimited amount more as far as funding enables. So we take, we decide on the content, oh, I'm gonna use uh, amyloids as an example as I go through this uh, process. So we take the content and we filter the content by the objectives and from this we create what I call key stories. These are the stories of what is it that we want to convey with this uh, set of activities. So for amyloids, for example, our stories were amyloids uh, are when uh, many different proteins can fold in a certain way, for those who know this, beta sheet folds, can fold in a certain way, and when they do, they have a tendency to self-aggregate into log fibrils. Those fibrils are called amyloids. So amyloids themselves are emergent structures, and we use emergence as a way to get people interested in the idea of amyloids. They also underline many relevant phenomena in natural systems, in new technologies, and in numerous uh, very severe diseases. Then this transdisciplinary uh, perspective, this idea of lots of levels, turns out in the understanding that we have developed about Alzheimer's disease, this has taken uh, information from studies ranging from epidemiology of families over generations, all the way down to x-ray crystallography and multiple studies from multiple length scales in between. And so that became um, an important story for us to tell. And finally, because we want to inspire this human relation relationship, and as well, we want to draw in people who wouldn't necessarily want to study the science of something until we convinced them of it. Uh, we looked, we chose to highlight Alzheimer's because it's a disease approaching epidemic proportions and look at human aspects of that as a way to draw in people whose interest really is in the arts and people and psychology and then use this as a way to interest them in the science. So these are our key stories. We then take the key stories and we go, okay, let's look at our target audience because we need to create activities that are going to be of interest and value uh, to our target audience. So we look at, and I, I, didn't, I left this out of this talk, but we look at the values that this group tends to hold. What things do they care about? What's important to them? And we also uh, look at learning styles because we want to cover different kinds of, uh, have activities that will uh, cover different kinds of learning styles. So our site is uh, accessible to lots of different types of people. And then we combine these to create designs for activities. And if we've done our job well, then these activities, one, will be of interest and engaging to our target audience, and two, will support our learning objectives. And now is when I actually need to know how much time I have left. Oh, we're aiming for, we're aiming for like 40 minutes. 40 minutes, minutes yeah, so, so like five uh, it's been minutes. To Okay, five minutes. Five minutes more. Okay, great. So, um, and now I have to get this the other way. So looking at, actually, I think I want to go to the home page and just show you the home page first. Okay, so here's the home page of the site. And um, I just love to show here some of our examples of things. But, uh, all right. Unlocking the universe is the exhibit hall on emergence. The fibril connection is the exhibit hall on amyloids. And we use this expanding method so that we can add many, many more exhibit areas. So if we go to the fibril connections, we had a series of stories. Uh, how are those stories reflected in activities? Well, this was the first uh, set of stories which had to do basically what is an amyloid, and an amyloid is an emergent structure. So we have to start by telling them about protein, proteins and protein folding and what are they. 
we tell them, oops, actually we should, I should go to this first. We tell them, behind this is, in the text I didn't read, is a simpler definition. This is a more complicated definition where we show them about the types of bonding, what creates amyloid structure and different type of structures that people have found from X-ray crystallography. Uh, we talk about how it's relevant to emergence. And then uh, for, so that's basically for amyloids as an emergent phenomena. And the fiber connection, this is uh, the one that I showed you before. And in this game, which we'll see if I'm lucky, uh, because in order to show you what I want to show you, I have to win, and I have to wait for a certain number of pieces <laughs> to come by, and they're all the bad ones, they're not the ones I want. No, why did I get three in a row? Anyway, I have to fill these with, with items that, there's one. Antibiotics actually is, um, there's amyloid material involved, actually that's one too. And let me get one more that I can show you. No, go away. I can show you the next one. Ooh, here we go. Excellent. So when this, my sound is off. I have this wonderful little sound that happens when that goes. But what you have then is once you fill up three, then you find out it tells you why antibiotics, what about this uh, is related to amyloids. Um, killifish, for example, they're embryos that survive dehydration in the Peruvian desert um, have uh, amyloid layers in them. So this was a way uh, to access um, people who really like to learn by using their body and working with their hands. Um, and I'm going on too long, so we're just going to go on to the next thing. I'll shut up. Um, OK, this is uh, about the neuroscience of um, Alzheimer's. And in, we created an immersive experience where, there we go where you zoom into the brain, and I'm going to skip some of it for the sake of time, but we zoom all the way in across the, the brain by the brain stem until we get down to the neuron forest level. So we go through a set of cells into the neuron forest. And within here, you can, uh, here we go, explore and find everything from discussions of the kind of brain damage that one finds from Alzheimer's as the disease progresses and what uh, symptomological effects are controlled by these parts of the brain. And at the other end of the extreme, we go all the way to looking at, here we go, uh, molecular mutations on the amyloid beta um, protein, the 42 unit versus 42 versus 40 unit versions, and seeing how as you change the quality of the end molecules on that group, your clustering behaviors changes. And if you follow this activity through, it then shows you why that makes amyloid or why amyloid beta 42 is proposed to be. Um, more toxic than amyloid beta 40. So we go all the way down to the lane scale of levels of molecular interaction and then all the way up on the other end to uh, actually we have some epidemiological study in there. And this is, this is our, our human aspects and in this case um, we have three things, and I probably don't have time to show you all of them. We have uh, this activity is um, self-portraits by an artist who had Alzheimer's and painted while his disease progressed. We have uh, an award-winning dance video that we created about uh, two people uh, in a relationship, one of whom has Alzheimer's and how that relationship changes as a disease progresses. And this is... Uh, this is an aging activity, so right, how, how do young people relate to a disease of old people? And so we follow, for example, certain people and watch them age. And you can see there's a key here that says, how is Alzheimer's relating to their lives? This orange border means that he has a relative with Alzheimer's during this part of his life. 
and you can follow it through and watch how uh, these people age and get little stories about their lives and anecdotal discussions of how Alzheimer's affects people. So if you weren't motivated to zoom into the brain and find a cure, then here you really become motivated. So as you can see, our, our four areas here overlap with those four um, objectives, uh, key stories, sorry, key stories that I showed you for amyloids. And so finally, this is not my talk. Here's my talk. Okay. Finally, just with our prototype studies, we also did self-reporting on whether we met our learning objectives. And so very quickly, uh, explaining emergence, basically, we have close to 100% saying yes. Uh, we, they felt like they could explain it after visiting. They could give examples about emergent phenomena, and they felt their knowledge had increased. Uh, did we illustrate the value of this perspective? 95% agreed for solving complex problems, and 84% agreed for problems that are important to society. Okay, we also want to use emergence as an idea to help teach visitors about amyloids. Those were the activities I just stepped you through. And 98% of our visitors felt their knowledge of amyloids was increased. That actually wasn't very hard because they had zero to start with. Um, and 93% felt their knowledge of Alzheimer's increased. But additionally, in this idea trying to inspire personal relationship, the stats that we got were 76% expressed an interest in seeking out more information about amyloids. Um, given that, that to many non-scientists is a relatively dry topic, I was really happy with that number. And 91% expressed an interest in seeking more information on Alzheimer's. And we do, I didn't show you this, but our website has resources lists that shows people where they can go for more information. We have a discussion bulletin board where they can discuss and post information as well. So, in conclusions, uh, EmergentUniverse.org demonstrates a new outreach methodology. It's an online virtual interactive science museum that uses emergence as a tool for engaging visitors with science. We've demonstrated it to be effective at reaching and engaging visitors. We've had nearly 10,000 visits since inception and at, at achieving, at least through self-reporting, achieving uh, our learning objectives. The home page, as I said, is designed to accommodate an unlimited number of new exhibit areas. And an extremely broad diversity of topics can be incorporated under this emergence umbrella. Uh, this umbrella providing an intriguing, engaging hook for our visitors to draw them in and explore the site. So with that, I'd just like to thank my collaborators, uh, most particular Steve Hartsog, my programmer and a collaborator on interactive design in San Francisco. Thank you for your attention. And I, I neglected to mention at the beginning, but I'll turn over the, the lead on the discussion to, to David uh, Pines. But uh, perhaps if you have some questions for, for Susie uh, directly right now. Uh, I also might add a comment. I had a student who uh, came to, to work with Rajiv and I, and he said that the reason he got interested is we spent three hours looking at this site one night. Um, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. So it works. Proof. A comment that your name, Emergent Universe, would it be good to have uh, something on the universe site? Because, you know, that, that, might be, that might be something which can be a big draw, actually. Mm -hmm. They'd be interested in learning about the universe mm -hmm. and the emergence of the universe. There are so many cool things that we could put on there, but you're right, universe is in the name. But I think in the choice of the name, universe was broadly defined to include everything on all eight scales. I guess, Susie, also, you didn't mention sort of what the quantum of cost is for an exhibit wing, at least so far. Oh, um, <clears throat> roughly, for an exhibit at the level of depth that we did amyloids, because obviously however many pages you develop will change how much it, the cost is, uh, typically about 150000 for development of sort of a complete exhibit area at the level we've been doing it now. And again, for a hard exhibit that would be of comparable quality and depth, you would think it'd be on the order of- One to two million. One to two million, right. Yeah, I think it's like 500 per square foot is what's usually assumed. 
you know, when, I, when I'm looking at this, this is really great. And when I was um, just watching it, it occurred to me, especially with your amyloid, that, you know, because you talked about these resources that you can, that you list and refer mm -hmm. um, the, the uh, explorer to. But the, 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 something like this could be such a great resource for the people who are doing research to right. draw people in to their research and to like link, you know, if there was like a link to people doing like the state of the art research in amyloids and Alzheimer's, right. where people could link and almost that they could almost even purchase it. No, that's, that's, uh, that's a really good idea to try to figure out exactly how that would work in deciding who gets to have a link. Right, yeah, and I mean, where where we would put them, you know, do we create a separate resources site, like, because we have our. I mean, there might be a there might be an opportunity for some kind of a marketing, a marketing. Uh, so here we so, are. Yeah, there are more. We do have links and learn more of the things that are online. So we could we have we have general more technical search terms. Um, we could add a researchers category, but then, and, and that one thing in the design of the site, um, that this particular page is a dynamic text file. So all you have to update this, these, these pages, they're just simple text files that need to be updated. So it's actually fairly simple. One of the issues with putting web links to people is that these change, and then you end up with a bunch of broken links if you're not careful and you don't have somebody constantly managing the site, which at this point we don't have the resources to, for that kind of level of upkeep. Yeah, so that was a, that was my second um, query. Can I oh, one sorry. of the thoughts? So the other thought might be to do sort of the other way around is alert people who are doing research in this area that we have this site and so they can direct people to the site so that it works both ways. Yes. Uh, but with the upkeep part of it, sure. you made the point that it's about 20% of the exist, uh, of, of the cost of a of a, a bill of the built exhibit. Yeah, you don't have fabrication exhibit. costs. And then and then but and then you don't have the, the building upkeep and all that stuff. Right. But there is a real upkeep with this. Right. And you but if to, you but but if you compare this the upkeep at this is substantially mm -hmm. less than the sure. upkeep of <coughs> of physical exhibits yeah. as well. But yes, there is, there's, there's sort of a, I mean, we just had a problem. I, I didn't know the new version of Firefox because it looks a little uglier than the new version of Firefox. You know, there's sort of this constant change in the browser technology. There's the broken links. Yes, it would be, it would be really nice to be able to keep doing that update. You go obsolete. It takes a lot longer to go obsolete before that. Um, but you can, you can make budgetary informed choices of how much of that you want to do and don't do, but I would say yeah, most academic institutions choose too little. Oh, uh, Dave? Where does your content come from? I mean, do you work with somebody who understands the research and yeah. they give you the content that you... No. <laughs> so, uh, let's take amyloids as example. Um, I actually went around and uh, talked to four different scientists who were experts in various areas of this field, and then two of them became advisors to me. So they kind of direct me into the literature. I do a lot of textbook reading, a lot of public science reading, and a bunch of literature reading, and then I put together ideas, I contact my experts when I have questions or things I don't understand or to direct me like, okay, I stumbled on two competing theories, tell me how I should interpret this. Um, and then uh, once I have, um, again, I work with my clients and my advisor with respect to this process of developing the key stories. So I do a bunch of research, I develop the key stories, I send them out to get vetted, approved, changed, altered, revised. We agree on something, I'll do more detailed research, I'll define concepts for the activities, send those out, go get those vetted, um, then sit down and again, end up doing a little more detailed research, putting together scripts, you know, like, uh, storyboards and scripts for these activities, and at that point those scripts go out to my experts and get vetted, and some of when we do the graphics, like the Neuron Forest, that went to um, a neurological expert that one of my, the, one of my, uh, David Teplo was my, one of my scientific advisors, and he took it to somebody in his department to say, yes, 
this is scientifically acceptable and okay. So it's sort of a vetting process that we use. And I just mentioned that, that of course, obviously we have a real treasure in Susie because she has, you know, she has an extensive scientific background and this great skill that's evident in the design of the, the pages. And uh, that could change the cost model uh, if, if, if you, because it's not clear you want to do this forever, for example. That, right. that could change the cost model because you might need two people to be able to do the same job that Susie does now as, as one. And there are also, I mean, there's, there's also other models that would rely on experts more and spending a lot more time having experts tell, for example, me or whoever's doing the design, the information, but there always needs to be that, um, that translation. Exhibit writing is a very specific kind of, t of technical writing, and you, you need that outreach and design uh, background and perspective to take that information and translate it for the public. So the role in which I am in some sense, it's, it's a combination of being by choice and knowing how busy faculty are because I was one, that I, don't, I haven't asked for, yes, I want a lot of input out of the faculty. I kind of take the, I'll try and find out what I can and if I'm stuck and have questions, I'm gonna call you in and have you help me out because that takes the burden off of them. But the balance can be shifted. You always want to maintain the emergent perspective because we may not know how to cast exactly. what we're interested exactly. in in this framework. Exactly, and that too. And, and that's where discussion is really valuable, to talk about it. Because I go, well, what about if I, if, if I use this? Does that make sense? Am I getting everything correct from the research perspective? Are we getting it right from the emergence <coughs> perspective? You know, if I translate it and leave things out so it's a level people can understand, is it still correct? You want to have one more question? Yeah, so first Marco, I want to yeah, say it looks, looks very nice. So very, very nice. So very nice design. There are people like this at the Boston Museum of Science, mm -hmm. at the Exploratorium, sure. the Lawrence Hall of Science, that are PhD trained scientists that do this translation type work. Exactly. And this type of um, work has been done a lot around nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. There's actually quite a bit of money that's been put in, yeah. both through the Exploratorium of Science Museum of Minnesota project, NiceNet, and they they haven't quite gotten it to a major exhibition space <clears throat> online the way you're, you're suggesting here. Mm -hmm. But there, there has been work done a lot promoting scientists that work at um, LBNL in their coins project, in their writing their nanotechnology projects. I used to work on a project that did that. We were aiming towards communicating information towards uh, 12, uh, 8 to 14 year olds. So it was a younger audience. So you're absolutely right that the 16 to 30 year old audience hasn't been nearly as catered to. Mm -hmm. the, one of the, the two places that I know of that have done, well, three places that have done that, that are trying to make an, a, a strong effort at that are Science Museum of Minnesota, Boston Museum of Science, and the Exploratorium. Okay. They do have a push. Um, Boston Museum of Science has more of a newsy angle. Is, is that speakers. fairly recent, that push? It's been going on for about six years. Okay. But they have different they have different angles, different approaches. Mm -hmm. If you want to get in touch with some of those people, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk to you. I actually participated at the Exploratorium. They had a, uh, what do they call it, like uh, Exploratorium at night or something. Yeah, uh, they had me They had mm -hmm. me walk through and identify exhibits that I thought illustrated the emergence. Uh, uh, and they had people give tours like that. Um, and it, it's all aimed at exactly this audience. It's trying to pull them. I think that's about two years old and it's all trying to pull them in. And then yeah. they, put, they post some of the stuff online. Um, yeah as videos and so on. Yeah, and there's an interesting, I mean, that 16 to 18 year old audience, you could also be thinking about catering to teachers that interact with that yeah. audience. You could be thinking about mm -hmm. high school. And so there's a bit, you're overlapping a variety of different audience types. Yes, um, yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's an interesting idea. I think there's some places that you might be able to But Marco, do you, some interesting do you think that, I mean, this particular hook uh, through emergence uh, and with this kind of, um, design that's so, um, Susie didn't say it, but she meticulously researched what appealed to that age group artistically and graphically. Has, has anybody put that kind of um, effort or found that kind of hook that you're aware of? Um, not, of course not with emergence. You know, I mean, yeah, no, not with emergence per se, uh, so that's a unique the, hook. The, the look yeah. is very, very nice. Uh, what I can't tell 
there has been a lot of work in on the gaming side, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, which also very much appeals to this age group. Yeah. And there, there's a whole rich research community on the gaming side. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some overlaps because they try to do some of this online type environments. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's, uh, you know, the Exploratorium, for example, has, uh, in, in these virtual worlds, has their own little exhibits. Yeah. Right. So are they in Second Life? Yeah, yeah. Second yeah. Life, okay. those types of environments. That's, just, that's a whole different Which is very different. Yeah. But yeah. Um, again, I think the question for me is what your fundamental goal is. Your fundamental goal is to try to get these students thinking about Science. I mean, I don't know if it's a public awareness, if it's a hook, you know, trying to get you into a career. There's different approaches. Um, I mean, I think this is this is inviting and is inviting exploration, which is a technique that's used usually successfully for getting more involvement and more curiosity, exploration, seeking. So I guess I'd, I'd have to think a little more about you know. Exactly what you're trying to aim for. Right. I mean, our, our focus, and, and one thing is, of course, focus gets shifted all yeah. the time. But but our focus had been, and um, you know, David can correct me on what his current thinking is. But in in the design of this part, focus had been towards really uh, just outreach in terms of making people aware of this, so that this is these are ideas that they would support and sort of like make them aware of this perspective, uh, teach them about different areas, get them invested in these areas. It was we kind of like a secondary or tertiary goal to get people interested in researching these areas. It was really hitting a broad cross-disciplinary group so that kind of across society as a whole, there would be an awareness increase. So ideally we get these things advertised inside some of the shoot 'em up games. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. Millions of people daily. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. In this age group. Right. And that, that's the trick, right? It's the holy grail trying to figure out how to get that. Let, let's let's stop right there and try to switch a little bit, Marco, to the topic of is this of interest to the Davis faculty? Is it of interest to the broader Davis community? Uh, our thought at ICOM is that. Susie has done an absolutely brilliant job concept for a cutting edge approach to education about science. And that it is infinitely expandable. It just depends upon the resources available. ICAM is not in itself capable of going out and raising the kind of money to do that, nor does it have the resources available to it as and in, as an online institution. So our thought is to find a lead campus to take it over. And thinking parochially, because Davis, I think we ought to turn the lights off. Well, Daniel, Daniel to not to help well, to you. Our thought is that uh, we ought to give Davis the first shot at this. Uh, we think we are making the Davis community, students, faculty, administrators, alumni, an offer they can't refuse. We are saying for a modest initial investment, a commitment of N thousand dollars, where N remains to be determined, uh, we are prepared to declare that Davis will become the lead campus for EmergingUniverse.org and Davis will be the campus from which proposals go to major private foundations, to the NSF, to various, to indeed perhaps the Department of Energy, some a broad set of possibilities for support. Davis would be the source of those proposals. Uh, why is this a good idea from the Davis perspective? It does three things at practically no cost for Davis. One, as the lead institution, it is in a way that every viewer of the site sees UC Davis prominently, so it's recognition. Two, if you're a faculty member, and you're really excited about the area of research you're working in, you are in a position as a member of the Davis community to make the case 
that your area should be the one that gets covered very quickly. And you have a say in what the content will be. You have a vote. Uh, the, I have had some experience in what a host institution derives from sponsoring a general public project. And that has to do with the Harvard course. Harvard has developed a series of online courses. One on the environment, it's currently doing one on physics of the 21st century. Not accidentally, a number of Harvard people are involved in explaining that to the world as a whole. So it offers an opportunity there. Finally, it offers, I think, a unique way of reaching out to all parts of the university. It's got this umbrella aspects. This is a way for people from design to work together with people in social sciences, physical sciences, biological sciences, agricultural science, and so forth. This is, has all the potential for a wonderful kind of community project, but also offers a framework through emergence of connecting a lot of different parts of the university in a, in a way that they're not connected. So that it seems to us that the startup costs have been covered by ICAM, mainly by its branch members, two-thirds by its branch members, a little bit by private money we've been able to work. So we, the startup costs are about 300K. And we're saying to the Davis Council, if a